Good afternoon. Hey. I'm going to do my best today to walk through what is a, a little bit of a, a complex uh, investigation involving a sexual predator. But before I get to the case itself, I just want to talk about an issue that is always a challenge. And I think that's an issue that should be a, a priority and concern for our community. And that is vulnerable populations. And oftentimes when we talk about sexual predators, we recognize that our children are most vulnerable. And we have a great level of concern. And we also think about the elderly populations, but a population that does not get enough consideration and care <clears throat> oftentimes are those who are either um, in unstable housing circumstances or living homeless, and those who are mentally ill or have some challenge relative to their um, mental stability. And the case that we'll be talking about today involves a predator, and that was the specific category of victims whom he targeted. Those who were vulnerable, living on the street, oftentimes um, with mental illness or schizophrenia. And his tactics were to try to find ways to entice them through resources or uh, housing stability until he could bring them to a space to, um, to abuse them, assault them physically and sexually. The suspect in this case, and I'm going to do my best to pronounce his last name, is Robert Incorvia. He was self-titled and identified. He said that his name on the street that he was recognized by the nickname was Rob the Rapist. It's a 51-year-old 50 year white male. We first received an allegation of an abuse from one of our victims in February of 2020. Since that time, we had three additional victims who we believed were... Uh, victimized in a similar fashion, but the challenge that we faced was because they are homeless, we had a difficult time with some of the victims getting the information necessary, locating them for follow-up and pursuing these things. But through the hard work and dedication of the deputies and the, the detectives in this organization, they, will, they were able to ascertain enough substantial information to give confidence that in fact these sexual assaults were occurring and abuses they were able to identify the suspect, locate him, serve search warrants on two residences that he was tied to, one that he lived in and the other one that he carried out the majority of these acts. And uh, we seized his vehicle and a considerable amount of evidence. His method was this. He would find people on the street, and, and these are statements that he delivered. He would look for those that he believed that were vulnerable in the categories I just described. He would lure them into his vehicle. They said that what he would do was offer them a place to go take a shower, some shelter, some resources, things that were enticing for them. He would bring them to a residence located in New River area. And just to give you some reference, the target area, more often than not, where he would find his victims was around 19th Avenue in Northern, in that general area, maybe a square mile or more in that general area. Take them to his home. He would sexually assault them. And oftentimes, after concluding the sexual assault, he would use restraints and physically bind them, bound them to a chair, and physically abuse them, assault them. Once he was done, there were times that he'd actually return them to the area or that they would flee from his house. Through interviews, through extensive work over these lengthy months, they were able to, as I stated earlier, identify him locate him, serve the search warrant, arrest him, and acquire evidence. The evidence inside the home in New River was substantial, relative, and consistent with these acts. Um, he acknowledged elements of it, which I won't get into his statement specifically, um, claiming more so that it was consensual. The victims, their, their statements and the evidence appears otherwise. So he was booked into our jail about two days ago. Now, recognizing that predators such as these their pattern of behavior, often what we see and what we find out about is a very small percentage of what is probable possible. So we reached out to our partners at other agencies, recognizing that these cases were initiated frequently in the city of Phoenix. So the Phoenix Police Department right now is going through a lot of cases to determine similarities by either um, MO or suspect description. 
as is Glendale PD. So we have somewhat of a small task force working together with other agencies to make sure that any and all victims who are potentially harmed by this suspect will be identified and we can hopefully locate them and provide them care and determine if, in fact, there are additional charges to be filed. Um, our next steps, in addition to what's going on as we speak, which is detectives continuing to work this case aggressively, we will be utilizing deputies as well as posse members to go into that particular area of the community to pass out information so that we can solicit additional information to uh, acquire as much evidence as possible to protect these victims and make sure that our prosecution is thorough. It will be a, an ongoing and complex investigation, but thankfully um, we have a lot of dedicated members of the organization as well as the posse members who recognize the severity of when you have a predator such as this who is targeting a portion of the population that is already suffering in many ways, um, that they pose some of the greatest dangers to the safety of our community. So with that, I'm happy to take some questions that are going to be reasonable and not expose elements of the investigation that are not yet uh, privy for the public. How many victims have you guys identified so far? We have four victims so far, and I can tell you that... He was booked into, uh, into our jail for three counts of kidnapping and two counts of sexual, excuse me, three counts of sexual assault and four counts of kidnapping. You uh, people are going to wonder if he had, when he said he had an MO, but like a type D. Can you tell us anything about the victim's age ranges, et cetera? That's a great question. And, and uh, normally you're right, predators oftentimes have a particular um, target that they feel most comfortable with when it comes to race, age, all those elements. In this case, what we have seen is that um, there were Hispanic and white females, but the age range is very, very broad. It goes all the way up to one of our victims was mid-50s and one was uh, in their 20s. Any idea what this man did for a living? I don't. I don't have information that he was, uh, what his profession was right now, but we can get that for you. And where did he, you said there were two um, addresses. Where was his main address that he was living at? So the, the, the address that was primarily his uh, residence was in the area of 31st Avenue in Thunderbird. So the majority of his victims were females? Correct, all the victims were females. You mentioned uh, the first tip came in, uh, and her allegation came in in February. How far back have you identified the actual assaults occurring? Well, right now we're actually going back as you know as far as, as any information will lead us. I've I've asked our detectives and our deputies to you know create this in a, in a task force manner where we are going to look at any and all cases of anything that is similar as far back as we need to, to tie these things together. And as you know, oftentimes when we catch predators, they're um, the volume of victims spans over many years in many different spaces. But are all the four kidnapping charges and three sexual assault from 2020? No. Uh, these ones, yes. The, the time frame I'm talking about, which was in February, until our most recent case was the end of July. And that was the one that really led our detectives to the, the tips and the information that they needed to identify the suspect and bring all these things together. Does he have any kind of criminal record? Let me take a look and see exactly what his criminal history was uh, prior to this. I don't think we did have any. Do we have any priors? Pardon me. You can speak up again here. Misdemeanor offenses, minor offenses, yeah. And you said you had this second home in New River, correct? Was this home, to your knowledge, strictly used for these crimes? Or was anyone else, you know, living there or renting, or is it just an empty home that he used for these? No other occupants lived there. Um, as like a full-time resident, it does appear that when he was carrying out the commission of these crimes, that that home was the primary location just for those reasons. Is there a particular time of day or night that he was going out and finding his victims, or was it kind of all over the map? No, it looks right now like a lot of um, a lot of the folks who frequent live in those areas that are homeless had familiarity with him, so it was a very comfortable space for him to look and to try to target for victims. And you said that he was known on the street as Rob the Rapist. So was it known amongst this community that this man was a predator and to kind of keep an eye out for him? Or how did you learn about that? So apparently, well, he actually acknowledged that and made the statement himself. But detectives have spoken to, to those who are, you know, um, residents or frequent that area there. And that was not unfamiliar. They were very familiar with his vehicle, which was a, um, it was a Hummer. 
and you guys got the information uh, in H2, and, and you know it stands out quite a bit. So he was a f he was a familiar person in that community, and this is a situation where, again, due to their vulnerabilities and his his ability to intimidate, um, it's almost as though they felt defenseless, I guess, to some extent against him, and he just kind of prayed in that space. You mentioned he would tie up the victims afterwards and physically assault them. Can you share any more information about what he was actually doing to these women? Well, I mean, without giving you specifics, just think of someone who was bound and then he is physically abusing and striking and assaulting them. You know, sexual assaults are hard to solve and they are lengthy investigations. Some people are going to wonder, you got the first allegation in February. What more did you need or what was difficult about solving it back in February that you needed more victims to come forward? Well, the most difficult part was just the fact that, as, as I said earlier, the, these victims were homeless and had um, at least you know some form of, of mental illness or schizophrenia. So initial information, reaching back to them, locating them became very difficult and tedious. So our detectives try to stay on track and actually would would put information out so that if that person was contacted by another officer or deputy at some point in time they could recontact them um, but the hardest part was just having victims who stayed invested with us or that we were able to reach as needed as we went through this process and for some they were just fearful you know they contacted us maybe made initial information but didn't want to cooperate any further and I, I can't speak to why they felt that way uh, but we know oftentimes with those who are victims of these types of crimes that that is the case so it was I, I know it feels like a long time frame and obviously we want to catch people as quickly as possible but the persistence of our deputies in this case and again often uh, or excuse me with victims who are often discarded overlooked because of circumstances because of those challenges um, the commitment by our team was exceptional you know and, and it's unfortunate that we see one victim let alone multiple uh, but there's complexities to it you touched on this saying that you teamed up with Glendale and Phoenix now, but does the nature of your investigation up to this point give you a sense that there are more victims out there? Well, I think that we all know that whenever you have sexual predators, that possibility is, is extremely high. We want to make sure that if there's information out there that's going to assist us in the prosecution of this, further information, that we make the public aware that we need their help. And, and if during the process of that there, there's additional, additional victims who come forward, uh, we want to make sure that their voices are heard also. So we're just making sure we're doing due diligence and being thoughtful to the need of, of this issue. And to th this, is, this is disgusting. You know, all cases of, of these types of crimes are, are horrible. Uh, but a person who conscientiously tells you, this is why I targeted this group because of their vulnerabilities and took advantage of them and did it repeatedly, um, right in the middle of a community where he was known by a term, Rob the rapist. We have to do better collectively as as a society. That was going to be my question. Can more be done to protect this vulnerable population? Because they are, uh, even if it's not a rape, it could just be uh, a burglary or you know a female sleeping at a bus stop getting a knife in her. You know, I mean, this happens often. Uh, as a law enforcement official who wants to protect all of Maricopa County citizens, how are you thinking about trying to protect the homeless? Well, I, when I said societal, that's where it begins. You know, look at other circumstances, and I know that we're getting a little outside the box, but, you know, when we talk about foster care, when we talk about those aging out at 18 and suddenly on the street because they don't have resources, doing more to get them stable housing. When we have homeless, uh, you know, community members, homeless in and of itself is a challenge, but now when you compile it with mental illness or other factors such as those, the more we do to get those folks the support they need from professionals who can give them what they need and get them the stable housing, the better prepared they are to live in a safe space and the more that we can do to keep them safe. So this is not a, this is not a, a singular issue where law enforcement can, can address it and resolve it. It has to be a societal effort where we look at all the factors and the variables at play and we say that we're committed to keep people safe. You mentioned that um, posse members, other deputies are, out, are heading back out to that neighborhood. So is it going to be like flyers that they're handing out, or what is the material like? Exactly. They'll, have, they'll pass out flyers, and they'll just meet with folks, talk face-to-face. -face. We're going to do it in a manner that is, um, you know, we don't want to intimidate or make a community uncomfortable. We'll work with our partners at Phoenix PD. You know, obviously we want to be respectful to that as their core jurisdiction also. So you'll see some plainclothes detectives out there who are able to interact and, and just you know work their way into those neighborhoods without creating unrest or without 
promoting any form of fear when they see a high volume of, of uh, law enforcement presence. How does that work? If someone is, let's say, uh, addicted to drugs, but they're sexually assaulted and they fear law enforcement because, you know, they have a possession charge or something like that, what would you say to, to homeless people that may be weary, or victims that may be weary of coming forward because of other things in their life? Well, yeah, and in, in, in I know you're speaking in one particular category, but we know this is uh, an element that ha that crosses a lot of boundaries. At the end of the day, if you're a victim of a crime and you come to us, our number one responsibility is to protect you, make sure that um, justice is served. And then the other aspects that you need to deal with, and we should be a facilitator to help you address or overcome or just make sure you're accountable to those factors. But we need to be seen as a safe haven to go to when you are a victim and not someone to run from. And, and that's always a challenge that we've had and will continue to have until we... You know, we find a way to, to better serve the community, to earn that trust, but at the same time to be trusted. In, in the suspect's um, suspect statement to you guys, did he indicate possibly how long he's been doing this for or how many victims he may have? He gave us some statements that I'll just, you know, I don't want to undermine the investigators relative to his practices and the volume. Uh, he also, um, you had spoken to this, you know, he, he talked about using other methods to include substances to try to entice people. So he had a lot of different tactics that he would use depending on who his potential victim was or his target. Um, but the volume was, um, uh, the volume of those that he interacted with is extremely high. Would he use any gun or any weapon to lure people out in his house? I don't know of any information or indications that, so that he would use uh, a weapon of any sort um, to create fear or to uh, um, to intimidate people into the vehicle. Usually it was coercion that got them with him and any offer of some things that would be um, enticing. And then once he got them to, to his home, then, then he carried out the axe. Is he from Arizona? Do you think it's cross state lines at all? I don't know. I mean, I, I don't know if he originates from here. I know that he's he lived here for some time, but it's always hard to say. You know, and we, we can't close our eyes to any possibility. Um, but right now, we feel like we have pretty good framework and we have a great partnership with our law enforcement partners with Phoenix PD and Glendale. So we'll work collectively and do the best that we can to identify every element possible. Did he live alone or have any wife or kids? He has, he has a family member. Can you specify? Uh, I don't want to speak to his family members who are. There's no reason to believe they're involved right now, so I don't want to jeopardize their safety. All right. Uh, again, thank you for being here. I hope that you will help us share this information, the importance of protecting vulnerable communities. Uh, I appreciate you guys for what you do, and, and we're really grateful for our partners in law enforcement, the posse members, everybody who's uh, contributing to try to wrap this thing up. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Thank you.